so my book um, politics without violence question mark we don't know whether we can have a politics without violence towards a post Weberian enlightenment and I'm exploring how our new understandings of violence and its reproduction could actually help us to co-construct a different kind of politics by understanding how Violence is a phenomenon that reproduces through all our socialisation spaces, from the intimate to the prison, to the school, to the community, to the construction of the nation state. I suggest that we could put violence much more in the foreground and recognise its impact on all our political life and our social relationships and how social relationships impact also on the reproduction of violence. I asked the question whether Weber's uh, understanding of the state as the legitimate monopoly of violence over a given territory remains adequate for the 21st century. So I'm very interested in how new thinking about violence might enable us to generate a politics that has a new quality of participation, which enables us to actually work on the conditions that we produce more violence. The conditions to live without violence are, of course, uh, a very, very big challenge. Um, and there's a lot of work to be done to actually think of all the factors that reproduce violence. We know, however, quite a lot. We do know, for instance, that inequality correlates with violence. Inequality more than poverty. Although a lot of people who live in very poor areas of the world suffer violence, it's the inequality that is one of, one of the issues that really generates feelings of shame, feelings of anxiety, feelings of desperation, and this impacts particularly on men. We know that young men are responsible for most of the violence and that most of the violence in the world is committed on young men. That is talking about violence measured in homicides, which isn't the only way to understand violence, but certainly that statistic that at least two thirds of violence is committed by young men on young men. That tells us something about how our constructions of masculinity also involve a sense of wanting status, recognition, um, and that if you don't get those things, the feelings of shame and humiliation are very strong. So that's another condition, we might say, that reproduces violence. So we know a great deal about these uh, factors that reproduce violence. We don't know enough, but I would argue that if we actually ask the question, um, about these factors of reproduction because we focus on the phenomenon of violence. We don't only focus on rape, we don't only focus on terrorism um, or on school bullying or on murder, but we actually look at the phenomenon of violence. I would argue that we are in a position to take action to reduce it. A very interesting conversation can now be had with natural scientists, um, biologists, people involved in genetics, epigenetics. This was a big challenge for me as a political scientist who works as an anthropologist and uh, to actually engage, but uh, I had to do that. I had to go to natural science conferences in order to really understand this social body and why it is that even natural scientists are now recognising that actually the biological body is a social body. And so when you begin to look at all the circuits in our body, the hormonal circuits, the neurotransmitters, the neurochemistry, the neuroarchitecture, you begin to see the connections between the, the cortex and the frontal cortex and the emotional part. Some writers that talk about an emotional brain and this division that we think of between reason and emotion is nothing like hardwired in our bodies. Our emotion affects our reason and we have the capacity to reason around our emotions. And this for me is what natural sciences can help us understand about violence. We had an experience of the rational enlightenment in Europe of the 18th century. And this emerged out of the religious wars and the extraordinary brutality. The Thirty Years' War in Europe was one of the most violent ever in history in terms of simply, simply the body count. So that rational enlightenment was to say, well, what we need is reason. But what we've learned actually is reason is not enough to reduce violence. Um, reason and rationality 
can also lead to the development of nuclear weapons. Um, it has also led to, some would argue, to the concentration camp and extreme rationality of genocide. And so what I'm suggesting is that what we need now is to understand precisely how emotion affects our reason and our reason affects emotion, how one could be used to scrutinize the other, not to abandon reason but to actually recognize that we need to acknowledge how our emotions are impacting on us. I don't think this is utopian because I'm already seeing both this route to an emotional enlightenment through academic literature, but perhaps even more important is the social action on violence that has taken place over the last few years. Naming something as violence is incredibly important precisely because of the potency of the whole, our understanding of violence. So in my lifetime, the naming of the rape of a woman in the home as a crime, previously this was not a crime, it was the private sphere, it was permitted and accepted. Now it is actually a crime. Naming rape in war, which happens in all wars, but it was really only with the Bosnian mass rape in the early 90s that the feminist movement and others came to recognize that this happens in all wars and it becomes an international war crime. Black Lives Matter, the actual differential experience of black people uh, in terms of violence from the police in the United States, that has opened up our understanding of how race and violence are connected and the way the state reproduces violence. It is not just within society that violence emerges. And so this social action on violence, and I would also add human rights defenders, um, all sorts of uh, actors that are trying to uh, reform the prisons, all these multiple actions that are taking place in the world today, they all contribute to violence reduction. And I think if we connect the action to new theories of politics that are trying to look towards the notion of a re-theorizing what has been taken for granted, that is the Weberian understanding of politics and the state based on a human ontology that we are incapable of dealing with violence. I think we could begin to put into practice some of the learning.